Karen Dunn Kelly, Deputy Secretary of Commerce, the United States. The Honorable Nkosazana Lamini Zuma, Minister for Cooperative Governments, Governance and Traditional Affairs. Dr. Akinwumi Adashina, President of the African Development Bank. The Honorable Soraya Hakuzi Yeremye, who is Minister of Trade and Industry, the Republic of Rwanda. Professor Benedict Orama, President of the Africa Export Import Bank. Agmasu Tadese, President, Trade and Development Bank. And we're joined by Ade Ayayemi, CEO, EcoBank Transnational Incorporated. Thank you all for joining me. Now, let's just look at where we are from an Africa continental free trade agreement perspective. The free trade agreement went operational on the 7th of July, 2019. Trade will commence under the agreement on the 1st of July, 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, that is just nine months if we're generous and we take <coughs> November into consideration. That is just nine months away before we give birth, if you'll excuse the analogy. And of course, President Adagina, I'm going to come to you at this point. The African Development Bank has been instrumental in its institutional support of the African Union. We have a secretariat that is now uh, setting up in uh, Accra in Ghana, and that has been with the support of the African Development Bank. With those nine months ahead of us, sir, what would you say the priorities are? Well, thank you very much. Um, it's good to be here, and thank you all for coming for this session. First, let me thank very much my dear sister, big sister, Dr. Lamini Zuma, because when she was head of the African Union Commission, was when the whole conversation started about the Africa we want. <laughs> and the Africa we want, I remember she made a statement at the time. It's a place, I think I remember her saying that, uh, our countries are our countries, but Africa is our home. And I think that began to put the impetus behind everybody to start looking at how do we open up Africa, bring all the walls down, you know, in Africa. I want to commend <clears throat> in particular our heads of state for all their leadership, forthrightness, and diligence in making sure that all the 44 countries have signed on to this treaty and all of that. And President Kagame was here yesterday. President uh, Sierra Maposa told him that he is the grandfather of the, uh, of the Africa continental free trade area, but also President Yusufu uh, of Niger, who has done tremendously, and all the other heads of state. Obviously, the key issue now is the rubber meets the road, we have to start going. And so the first thing that we've done is that we've provided uh, about you know, $5 million to the uh, continental free trade uh, area secretariat, uh, which is based at the, in, in Ghana, which was given the, the mandate to host that. So we're very delighted uh, to continue to do that. But I would say that for the African Development Bank, actually, we didn't have to wait. We didn't wait for the Africa continental free trade area to be investing all the things that are necessary to make it work. You know, investing in critical infrastructure, uh, investing, we'll have more time to talk in more details about this, the investing in integrating our financial markets, investing in connectivity across all the countries, also investing to make sure that we can, um, you know, Madame Zuma, when she was uh, the chairperson, I remember she started this thing called the AU passport, you know, which allows us to have a passport, allows us to go everywhere, you know, in, in, in Africa. I think you should give her uh, she... Because we, we found out in the case of, of Africa, we do this, uh, my vice president here, Pierre Gislen and his team, they do a fantastic job of this thing called the, the, the Africa Visa Index, which actually mm. shows that you know, you can go 25% of the countries you can go to right now without needing a visa as an African. 
right? In 21%, you still need to have uh, a visa. But at 50 something percent, you still have to get uh, visas to go. So much work still needs to be done there. But I think the enthusiasm is there, the political will is there, the reality is in front of us. We have no option, it's going to work. And we just have to continue to make sure we do the right things to make sure that we deliver on the promise of the continental free trade area. Minister Lamini Zuma, President Adashina has clearly said you ceded this while you were chair of the African Union from 2012 to 2017. How do you feel that we are just nine short months away from seeing this project come to light? Well, thank you very much. I feel very proud of us as Africans because this is part of Agenda 2063 and it's part of economic integration of Africa that our forebearers so wanted. But I'm also proud that we kept to the deadline. In 2015, right here, when we had the AU <coughs> summit here in South Africa, we, start, we, we launched the negotiations. And we said by 2017, the negotiations must be done. And indeed, they were done. And what is important is that it was Part, it's part of the flagship projects in Agenda 2063, but it was the first one to be achieved. And we said, if we don't achieve it in the, in the time we have set for ourselves, nobody's going to take us seriously. And we thank all the officials, we thank the heads of state for keeping to that deadline, because it's going to mean a lot to Africa. It's going to change Africa uh, in, a, in, a, in a big way. Let me come to Minister Hakuzi Yeremye and uh, the role, obviously, that President Kagame of the Republic of Rwanda has played <coughs> in the project. Can you add your voice as we go around the, the, the first uh, turn of the panel in terms of what it means specifically from a Rwanda perspective as you stand representing President Kagame today? Yeah, thank you. And uh, first and foremost, I would like to, to pass on the regards of His Excellency President Paul Kagame, who couldn't be here today due to um, all the national commitments and had to go back to, to Kigali. Um, I think from, from um, the start, the fact that the uh, African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement was signed in Kigali, um, under the leadership of, of His Excellency Paul Kagame, but also uh, taking into account that this is the will of all African heads of state to have that agreement signed and make sure it's ratified within a year. A lot of people didn't think that it would come into force after a year, but that happened. Um, and as we move forward into um, you know, respecting the deadline of starting to trade in July 2020, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of negotiations on the tariff concessions, in terms of uh, making sure that, you know, we agree on which goods will be li liberalized first, and also uh, making sure that we have more countries that ratify by that time. Now we have, I think, 27 or 28 countries that have ratified, and, you know, although the agreement has now been signed by 54 countries, countries out of 55, uh, the ratification process is ongoing. Um, and, and another element is also uh, for um, a landlocked country like ours is to make sure that we can take advantage of that uh, free trade area, meaning all the investments that Rwanda has made to build um, <clears throat> A, a conducive business environment, but also investing not only in our people to have the skills required so that in our industrialization process, we make sure that we create jobs and have are equipped to be able to industrialize quickly. And second, uh, making sure that we uh, put in place reforms that are attractive to investors, but also make a business uh, easily, easily um, made in our country and that has taken more than, than 10 years when we now uh, you know hear and see that Rwanda is ranked the second uh, easiest country in Africa to do business it's not something that was done overnight and I think we have to take that as an example as a country but also as a continent that the CFTA will be successful but gradually uh, there are still a lot of work to be done but the political will is there and the deadlines have been respected so I believe that by July 2020 <coughs> we will have finalized the first set of negotiations. So, Minister Hakuzi, you're in there. 
mentions that 54 countries have signed the CFTA. Eritrea is the only country outstanding on signatory. And when it comes to the ratifications, 28 countries have ratified the agreement. And the latest ratification came from Mauritius, just to, to give you that update. Madam Secretary, thank you very much for, for joining us. And, and when I was doing research for our discussion, I went to the US Department of Commerce website, as one does, and realized that you are the Chief Operating Officer, Madam Secretary, of an $11.4 billion budget, and that you have 47,000 employees uh, at your command. So it's great to have you with us, and I think it's very important to get your voice as the United States on the uh, AFCTA and how you are looking at the potential that Africa has to, if we get everything right, become the largest free trade area in the world by 2050. Um, yes, and if you'd ever been to the Department of Commerce, you would not say 47,000 people at my command. <laughs> <laughs> you would know that's not the case. Um, so I, I, I really first and foremost want to thank you very much for inviting me to represent the United States to be on this panel, it is an honor to sit amongst such um, uh, est uh, established people here and, and who have really done just tremendous work to get to the place that we're having this panel discussion on this free trade agreement. So I'm, I'm really humbled and honored to be here and I have truly enjoyed the conference and engaging with so many of you over the last days. So I, I, I will make my comments pretty, pretty short and sweet. Uh, in, a, in a matter of uh, several words, uh, how do we feel about it? We support it very much. We think it's a great idea. And, and as we think about it, we really, I would like to add to some of uh, the other panelists, really very much congratulate the heads of state, the participants, and all those people who have spent diligent many, many hours in working to get this done. It is a tremendous feat, and, and so we congratulate you very much. When we think about this, we think about not only congratulations, J July of 2020, some of the work that needs to be done, and we sort of say to ourselves, the success of this will really depend upon the full participation, as well as not only from the countries, <clears throat> but from the private sector to get the full value out, out of what you're, what you're endeavoring to do. And we really believe by opening these markets and um, laying the groundwork, you're going to create competition, you know, trade diversity, and, and growth across the continent. And as you said, you will create the largest market in, in, in the globe. I also want to be very clear that as we sit here from the United States perspective, not only do we uh, support this, we uh, lend our help in any way that we can be of uh, use as you go through this process. President Arama, if I can bring you in now, and if we can go straight to this issue of financing uh, the trade agreement and your thoughts as Africa Export Import Bank, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. And let me also add my voice to thanking our brother, President Deshino, uh, for a marvelous Africa Investment Forum. Uh, we are partners in it, uh, but uh, he is the leader, and he has led us very, very well, and I must say congratulations. <laughs> it is this kind of leadership that I think Africa needs. When we create platforms, we see things happen. If this didn't exist, we would not have known that it was possible to come here, come to a place, and find Africans with uh, investment opportunities and investors from all over the world negotiating businesses worth more than $60 billion. It never happened. <laughs> and having said that, uh, financing is very, very critical to achieving the goals of the AFCFTA. Um, first of all, uh, the political act has been done, and we must congratulate all our leaders who finally decided to take Africa's destiny in its hands. 
the fragmentation caused by years of colonialism has been the cause of the difficulty Africa has been facing. And that is what FCFTA is finally trying to resolve. However, the political act will not cause the trade to happen. There are very, very uh, difficult things to be done. First, and I think the priority now, is um, the adjust, dealing with the adjustment costs. It is dealing with the adjustment costs that will determine how many borders will be open or closed on July 1. Countries are already estimating uh, tariff revenue losses. Companies are complaining uh, that uh, they will be disadvantaged uh, because of competitiveness issues. So the, as a matter of priority, we must deal with that. And that is why uh, we are working with the African Union and uh, with support from the African Development Bank and I think we partnership with other financial institutions here to try and put in place an AFCFTA adjustment facility. Our estimate is that it will cost about $5 billion. Uh, and our board has approved $1 billion. And we, we are looking forward to other countries. And uh, I hope uh, countries like also the United States may, uh, sh uh, can come and help with concessional funding so that we can blend uh, the commercial funding that we bring to be able to deal with this immediate challenge. Because if borders are closed on July 1, the confidence will be lost and the businesses will not go ahead. Uh, the integration may not happen as we are all hoping for uh, today. But beyond that, uh, there are other things we need to do, uh, financing. But I think uh, one of the greatest things we need to do is information. Uh, 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 in the past years, I think the work of our governments and the African Development Bank and other institutions have led to some infrastructure existing in the continent that currently today carries about $1 trillion of uh, total trade. But the problem is that out of the $1 trillion, intra-African trade is just less than $170 billion. And the problem arises because we do not know what is happening across our borders. Egypt, uh, Egypt uh, imports something that maybe Sudan actually uh, exports to the outside world. Uh, today, uh, Ethiopia um, imports certain kinds of leather that Burundi exports to the outside world. So unless we begin to deal with these information issues, again, trade will not happen. Uh, these are the early priorities and low-hanging fruits, but they are critical and we must pay attention to them. Thank you. President Larama, you bring us perfectly to Rani and Tuli, who plays in that regional infrastructure space. And Rani, I think you also pull in now the private sector voice. It has been reiterated over and over again that if the private sector is not involved in these initial stages right through to the final implementation, then we have a problem on our hands in terms of the success of the regional trade agreement. Uh, Ronnie, I'm going to get you to come in here, uh, specifically with the private sector voice, and then picking up on that discussion point brought to bear by President Orama, which is the regional trade infrastructure. Yeah, so that's correct. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. So again, let me begin by echoing the, the, the voice and say thank you very much, President Adeshina, for the work that you and the bank and very importantly, the partners to this uh, platform have done in bringing us all together. It, it, I, I think you don't realize the immense task uh, that the African multilaterals and other partners have done in pulling us together. And I think for that, we should give uh, the partners a round of applause. So maybe let's 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 start at the beginning and i had the, a really exciting conversation with the uh, minister kosazanajamini zoom about the history of how we actually oh. ended up getting here uh, but again to echo the words of celebration to the politicians who have actually delivered what in my interpretation personally is possibly the biggest milestone since independence that is how important the free trade agreement is for us the broad statistics are well documented. Uh, Intra-Africa trade, we're the region that trades the least within itself. 
the highest being Europe at circa 58%. We sit uh, at about 15%. We sit uh, circa 15%. South America at about 20%. Uh, North America at about, I think, uh, 48% or around there. So that's well known. Uh, we contribute to global trade circa 3%. That is principally because of two reasons. If you imagine a global industrial value chain or a supply chain being A to Z, we extract minerals, which is A, and we ship them to a port, which is B, and they get processed, and then we import them back, which is Y, and we consume, which is Z. We're exporting the rest of the remainder of the alphabet we are exporting, uh, in the famous words, no, uh, we are exporting African livelihood, we are exporting African jobs, we are exporting African wealth. That's the reality of it. So, understanding that the, the issues are well, the numbers are well understood, where to from here? Especially the, from a private sector perspective especially and regional a, infrastructure trade. Co considering that uh, the politicians have really taken, taken us far forward, and deliver this, doc, this uh, agreement, what are the pitfalls that we need to address today as the private sector on the continent? The first is you cannot trade unless you're producing. And producing means you can't be extracting mineral resource and exporting it out of the continent. So how do we go from B to C? Uh, so industrial capacity and processing becomes important. But you can't get to industrial processing unless you have logistics. Unless you have a connected continent, you cannot. Uh, so for us, the intervention that we have decided to pursue is within that uh, spectrum. We have a big task as TelloDB, uh, which is to deliver mobility on the continent of Africa. So we invest in railway infrastructure and we operate railway infrastructure on the continent of Africa. We think that that is our destiny in contributing to sustainable livelihood for average Africans. President Tedese, I'm going to pick up on Ronnie's numbers. I'm going to throw another one out there, is that manufacturing output on the African continent currently sits at $500 billion. If we get the trade agreement right, we can rock that up to $930 billion by 2025. So let's talk now again to the finance aspect from the, the Trade and Development Bank and, and as you weigh in on the conversation. Th thank you, Bronwyn. Um, I'm just going to build on, on the concept uh, that Dr. Rama mentioned. I think for us as specialized financial institutions that were set up 30 years ago, in our case, 35 to be exact, we were set up actually in anticipation of a free trade area to be created. So our reaction, first of all, this year was when it finally happened, we said, at last, <laughs> finally, because this has been in the making for over three decades. And in fact, uh, sometimes I'm asked, what portion of Africa's trade is regional that you finance? Because you are created precisely to facilitate regional integration. And I used to always hang my head down and I say, can you ask me another question? Mm -hmm. Because most of our trade financing is, is about trade between our African economies and the rest of the world. Partly it's because of lack, lack of complementarity, as Ronnie has mentioned. But of course it has to do also because even in goods and services that could flow today, there's so much red tape, there's such poor infrastructure, it just doesn't make sense for, for, for business people to target markets next door. It's easier sometimes to target markets overseas. So for us as financiers, we're delighted because it reduces market risk. We all talk about the complications of the trading regime worldwide today. I think for an African financier like, like us, we would be very happy to see some of our clients, like Ronnie, being able to rely on significant volumes of business across borders so that he is not subject to some of the vagaries of, of difficult trade policies that might arise. You never know what's gonna come up tomorrow. So I think one of the things we like to see from a risk mitigation point of view is to have at least a significant marketplace here within the region that can give our clients enough room to maneuver. And we know that this continent is very large, it's very well endowed, mm. a lot of comparative advantages. They're not all the same. 
And we know that if the physical barriers and the institutional barriers are dealt with, it will unleash a great deal of development. I think many of us are familiar with the very bold measures that have been taken in recent years to establish industrial parks, agro-processing zones, cross-border infrastructure, one-stop border posts. There's a lot actually that's been in the making to help facilitate this. The institutional element around the elimination of tariffs over time was the missing piece. And I think for, for, for a banker like, like TDB, we, we see this as a very significant incentive to businessmen, to African business, businessmen to start really looking at the regional market and to start investing across borders because they can take advantage of these new opportunities. It's all about risk management. Mm. That's what every financier will always boil down to. And I think our leadership has now finally helped reduce some of these macro risks that we have no role to play in. Bankers follow policymakers in terms of accepting the, the prevailing conditions. So we're, we're delighted. Uh, we feel it's finally come. Uh, there's a lot of investments that have been made. Rail, for instance, if you just take the last three years in my part of Africa, we've seen three mega projects in rail being invested. We have the one in, in, in Tanzania that's just in construction as we speak, uh, very bold. We have the one in Kenya and we have the one in, in Ethiopia. These are three, four billion dollar projects. What keeps me up at night sometimes is how are we going to ensure returns to these big investments? Because this rail will only be sustainable to the effect that we're able to use it. The goods have to move. And the goods are not just going to be moving overseas as we have in the past. The goods have to move within the region. So I, I really hope that the um, incentives now will give people like Ronnie the confidence to keep investing across borders, whether it's <laughs> locomotives or otherwise. And Ade, let's, let's bring you in, uh, in your confidence of investing, obviously bringing in your financial expertise as well. Let's keep the conversation going in terms of the actual financing elements of the trade agreement. Uh, thank you. I'm also to uh, add my voice to thank all the organizers present uh, at the China, and also the political leaders for having the courage to say that we should come together. If we can come together to compete in football and that raises the competencies of our people and raise to, to the top, we should be able to compete together in businesses and raise to the top, raise to the top instead of racing to the bottom. When I talk to, as a financier, when I talk to companies, the first question I ask them is, so what is your market? Who are you going to sell to? If the person is in the country where I live is in Togo, I say, what's the population of your country? It will tell me seven million people. How many people can you address? And that starts scaling down the ambition of that business. And starts, that starts scaling down the level of financing we can give to that business. And that starts creating potential for failure of that business. But if anybody, as we go forward, and I hope we really give this a real push that it requires so that we can have a better continent for our, our children. When I ask somebody, what is your market? He will tell me it's Africa. It's over a billion people. Then it looks like somebody that wants to invest in India who will say a billion people as well plus. And therefore, the chances of that business being able to scale up, the chances of that business having access to capital increases substantially. When I ask that business, who are your suppliers? Who will say, well, some of my suppliers are in my neighborhood, but I also have supplier in Ethiopia, supplier in West Africa, supplier in Central Africa. Because if, we start, if I start talking to that company, I will see that the chances of failure is becoming lower and lower. Because he has markets where he's selling to, he has suppliers that is coming from that market. Therefore, it's a win-win situation that that company is creating. And that is how we can get companies that can be bigger. Because I support SME. It's very good. But we need big companies to be at the forefront of innovation and research. And those are the big companies that will take us forward. They will now be able to start buying from our small and medium scale enterprises. So we should do this. All of us think no is important. Uh, all of us on this uh, stage have not uh, chosen to be here. Uh, time has chosen us to be here at this time, and we need to deliver. Thank you. Rolf, let's talk about what the agreement means to you as MTN, a heavyweight in the private sector playing across the African continent. 
are you looking forward to some low-hanging fruit as MTN? Yeah, Brahman, uh, thanks very much. And I firstly would like to just echo the sentiments expressed already, which is to thank uh, the African Development Bank, here presented by President Adesina and the partners, and uh, most uh, importantly, uh, you know, the political will of our political leaders to get us here. If you think about where we came from, 1963, and the forefathers had this ambition of a single Africa, you roll forward to Abuja 1991, and there is this intent to build these regional economic communities that will move towards Agenda uh, 2063. All of that, you know, from an MTM perspective, we are right behind that political will, and we believe we need to play our part. Um, the second thing I would say is that I think as we journey uh, with regards to uh, the vision that is espoused by Agenda 2063, I think we have to have both you know, the positivity, the enthusiasm, as well as the realism. And the realism is the fact that, and as mentioned before, that there are going to be adjustment costs. I think we need to make those adjustment costs visible so that once they're visible, we can deal with them. And between the private sector and the public sector, we can tackle these and uh, continue our journey forward. So, you know, we're excited as MTN about uh, the, the agreement and that, uh, because we, our home is Africa. Um, we have 244 million subscribers across both Africa and the Middle East, and 170 of them are on the African continent. So that's about 15% of the African uh, population is served by some connection with MTN. So I think I had to put that infomercial into the whole thing. <laughs> well done, um, very sneaky of you, but, but uh, we'll but, give it to you. But uh, just on the substance issue, as we think about is MTN, we're excited about for um, a couple of additional reasons. So the first one is just the movement of people. So across our full value chain, um, you know, we touch about five million people in terms of the development of telecommunication services, digital services, and increasingly more financial services. So of that five million, only 20,000 are permanent employees. Uh, the rest are distributors, parts of the value chain. Now of those 20,000, we have struggles right now to be able to move people around, whether it's visas, whether it's work permit. And at any one stage, uh, we have about 200 odd uh, people who are trying to move to different markets. You know, we employ 32 uh, different African nationalities uh, at MTN. So we were trying to get a radio engineer from Nigeria into South Africa, or somebody from the consumer side from uh, Rwanda into Zambia. Those moves, which are about the ability to drive productivity, but as well as the ability for talent and human capital development, it's very tricky. And you know, if this agreement is solving that, you know, we're fully supportive and uh, you know, we'll uh, do our part there. The second, actually, is the movement of goods. And a lot has been said that uh, the bring down of tariffs is the most important aspect. Now, we would, as MTN, say for sure we support that, but the non-tariff barriers, as well as the lack of infrastructure for us, is probably a much more concerning issue. So the easy math is to say tariff X, Y, Z is no longer applicable, but the harassment as we move our capital goods you know, from country X to Y, as well as the lack of infrastructure, both roads, rail, and power become other constraints. The third area is really around the harmonization of regulation. You know, we are a capital intensive business. We put about $2 billion of capital expenditure every single year in our markets. Um, and we need certainty, predictability of political environments, as well as regulation. Now, the regulatory environments that we face is quite varied, and we need to always be adjusting and anticipating. And I guess, you know, we are super committed to the African continent because it's our home, but you can well imagine that some investor from outside the continent would find the regulatory framework uh, more challenging. Um, but that would be an area that we would see as needing address as we pro progress. Specifically to our industry, you know, we believe that you know, tackled appropriately, Africa should be a place where you can roam like home. Why should the Europeans be able to do it? Because they've you know, harmonized the regulations. Africa for sure can do it. The final area I would point out is really probably the longer term, and we need to be sober and, uh, and, and well-minded as we approach this. And that's really the, you know, the kind of Nirvana vision of a single kind of currency and monetary regime. I think you know, a lot of regional economic communities have attempted that, uh, and there's been varied and even successes there. But that, I think, 
from our perspective, is something that is actually much longer term. We've got to get the macroeconomic uh, frameworks to kind of start converging before we, you know, we, we get there. So we'll quite happily as MTN live with kind of multiple currency regimes for a while uh, so that we, you know, we can steadily get to, to that end goal. But Bronwyn, we're super excited and uh, we'll play our part to, you know, to make this a success. So when we put out the uh, debate on the social media platforms, a lot of people came back and said, please take this discussion to a practical level. And we're going to do that for the next half an hour in terms of the practicalities, the implementation, how we sensitize, sensitize Africa, small businesses, the 445 million small businesses across the African continent. How do we get them on board with the free trade area? And President Adashina, when we were in Malabo in Equatorial Guinea for the African Development Bank annual general meeting, it was crucial in terms of the presentation that you did at one of those sessions, and that was showing the regional infrastructure that is developing across the African continent as a result of investments made. And uh, I mentioned here the uh, Lagos-Abidjan corridor, Lapita corridor between Angola and Zambia, and I know that you can pick up on more of those for me in terms of the real tangible traction that we are seeing from a regional infrastructure development perspective. Uh, thanks very much. So I will probably talk about three types of infrastructure. One is the hardcore infrastructure. Mm. Talk a little bit more about what the MTN CEO was talking about in terms of digital infrastructure, but also financial uh, infrastructure. So if we pick, for example, just the uh, issue of physical uh, infrastructure. So for physical infrastructure, for example, we, if you take Gambia and you take Senegal, next to each other. There's no bridge linking them. So how do they trade? And so since 1974, they've been trying to figure out how to do that. So we invested in January this year, we completed the Senegambia Bridge, which are now links both countries. Today, we, last year we came to this platform, myself and Alani Bobise, who was somewhere around here, the CEO of Africa 50. And we committed that we will put our $500 million to do the Congo Bridge to link the DRC Congo and uh, to, to uh, uh, Congo Brazzaville. In fact, when I went to Congo, uh, I was with president of uh, DRC Congo. He said, well, you know, um, the other country, you know, we're just across. And I went to the other side and said, well, the other country just across. Except you swim, you can't get there, right? Mm -hmm. And so we decided we have to con connect those two things with road mm -hmm. and rail, which we are going to do. You take, for example, the investment we made to connect Addis Ababa to Mombasa, 1,000 kilometers. And that alone has increased the trade, bilateral trade between um, Kenya and e Ethiopia by 400%. Uh, we're talking right now in Uganda, I mean to uh, Tanzania, and, and Tel Odb is part of that conversation about railways that you were saying, Admasi, that to connect Tanzania to Rwanda Rwanda to Burundi, Burundi to DRC, Congo, Goma, where they have a lot of mines, a, a, a lot of minerals. And so that issue of physical infrastructure, transport infrastructure, we're going to continue to do. One other example I can give you is the Nakala Corridor in the Southern Africa area. It's changed everything for us. Yeah. The Kasungula Bridge, it's changed everything. So we're building all of that. Now on digital infrastructure, if MTN doesn't have that digital infrastructure, if there are no data centers in today's world of fourth industrial revolution. We can't just be talking of the economy of today, We've got to talk about economy of tomorrow. It's a digital economy, fourth industrial revolution. We have to, and we are going to invest a lot in data centers, a lot more in digital infrastructure. We've done that for the Central Africa backbone. We did for East Africa uh, backbone. We've done for Trans-Sahara backbone, linking Niger, Chad, Mali, Nigeria, all the Algeria, so all that is going. But let's speak financial uh, infrastructure. So, for example, uh, Pierre Gislain and, and their team, my vice president, they're doing a phenomenal job just integrating financial markets. Because if you're going to be really trading, right, you've got to connect all of your stock exchanges together, mobilize domestic savings to support a lot of that investment and trade. And so today we are investing, connecting Casablanca all the way to Cairo, to uh, uh, to Lagos, to, to uh, Abidjan, and also to not, uh, 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 Namibia, uh, and all of that. So that's important. But final thing I want to say, it's about the issue of 
access to finance to trade, for women in particular. Look, the people who run Africa today, if you want to see them, go to any market. They are women. Women run this continent, right? <laughs> and the problem is they don't have access to finance. And that's why the African Development Bank, we set up this thing called the Africa Afawa Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa to mobilize $3 billion of financing specifically for businesses or women. We are going to make sure that the small businesses, the small women selling stuff and moving across borders have access to, to finance. And we've committed as a bank to also provide a billion dollars of lines of credit specifically to women business women, uh, women businesses to be able to trade across borders. So I think at the end of the day, the women, you know, uh, they, they, they trade 75% of our trade that we're talking about all here. It's informal trade. And so we got to make sure it's safer for women to trade. The point that was made in terms of documentation, we have to make sure it's easier for them. We have to make sure that they understand the rules of trade that we are talking about. And more than anything else, that they have the access to, uh, to, 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 uh, to finance to be able to trade. And I'll just take you one quick example of why I think women deserve that. 1982, I took a, play, a flight from, from Lagos to Abidjan. I got on the plane. It's all these women, and they were very fat. They were walking right through the aisle of the plane. <laughs> And I was wondering, we are the same size. No, just hold on. <laughs> yeah, no, but hold on. President uh, Adishina, you sure yeah, you want well, me to let uh, you continue with this? Yeah, no, <laughs> well, I know. <laughs> but it's an uh, important <laughs> issue. It's because they get treated badly, right? So they have to wrap the bales of clothing around themselves because somebody's cheating them, right? Overtaxing them. Mm -hmm. They got on the plane. All of a sudden, they took out the tapes, and they are the same size, right? They put it all up there, and I was just an economist walking around with my small computer looking for a way to put my computer. The, the hostess came up to me and said, how many times do you fly this plane? I said, it depends on my business. He said, you see all these women here? They may look like they don't really wear suits like you guys do. They run this plane. They own this plane. They fly twice a day. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, just give me your computer. We'll put it under. under, make more room for the women. And I think that's what we need to do. Clearly. Putting you firmly in place there, so, um, <laughs> Mr. Lamini Zuma, I'd like to pick on the, the women and uh, keep, keep going with that conversation as well as young people, which comprise the, the largest proportion of the African continent, small, medium enterprises, and the stat that President Adeshina put on the table with regards to the informal sector, I would like to elaborate on. So 66% of employment in sub-Saharan Africa comes from the informal sector. 52% of employment in North Africa is created from the informal sector. So let's take that conversation and further the integration of the informal sector into this enormous trade agreement, which really is there ultimately to service those players. Thanks. I think for a start, women were ahead of us because if you look here in Southern Africa and even across Africa, they are already trading across the borders yes, without the free trade. So what we need to do now is to support them to increase, to scale up their businesses so that now they can trade even more and formally. But we also need to make sure that co-ops are supported, the small businesses are supported because my brother there talked about the big companies. Yes, the big companies are important, but their suppliers yeah, that's must come from the small ones. That's great. So the, 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 the suppliers, whether you are talking about a, a big a car manufacturer, mm -hmm. but the parts Company. must come from the small business, and the women must be integrated into that. And thanks to you, my brother, that you are realizing that the financial institutions are not so kind to young people and to women. And I hope that besides the good work you're doing in the fund itself, you will also influence all the financial institutions to show that women need to be supported financially. But I think also 
us as governments must play our part in supporting them. But if you look at what the ADB's priorities are, amongst them, there is Light Africa, which means energy infrastructure. There is Feed Africa. Who's feeding Africa as we speak today? It's the women. If you look across Africa, it's the women who are in agriculture, but they don't own the land. They work on it. So we need to, to have policies that give them access to land and to allow them to own land. Some countries have started, but not everybody. So we need to make sure that that happens. But we need to also not just say they must produce, but we were discussing again with my brother some time back about making sure that we can have all the value chain so that they produce, but they can also process, and then they have access to markets. So women are actually going to be very critical and young people in the success of this uh, free trade agreement as entrepreneurs, but women are also going to be consumers. And it's high time that we produce what we consume because at the moment we produce what we don't consume and consume what we don't produce. So hopefully, as we put all this together, we will change that. But I, I agree with him completely that the women are going to be the drivers. They are as we speak, but they are not recognized either. So it's high time we recognize their role even today. So analysts are predicting that we can increase intra-Africa trade by some $35 billion on an annual basis, and we can reduce external imports by up to $10 billion on an annual basis if we get this right. Mm. I'm cognizant of time. We've got 19 minutes. This is the Africa Investment Forum. We promised you a debate where we would look at unprecedented investment opportunities as it pertains to the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. So we have a heavy hitting panel. Madam Secretary, I'm going to come to you. We are basically going to go through the panel again, and I want you to talk to this audience about the investment opportunities that are afoot as a result of the free trade agreement. And uh, Madam Secretary, if you'd like to weigh in, I know you also had a point to make on private sector integration into uh, the framework and the, the success that that needs to deliver. Yes, thank you very much, and cognizant of your now 18 minutes and 43 seconds, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be quick. I, I, I think when you think about all this, I would want to first start by saying that when we think about how the U.S. government and how private sector in the U.S. is going to be involved in this, we first have to sit back and say that the U.S. government, we think of our greatest asset as being the private sector. So when we think about that, we separate it out a little bit to say, what is the U.S. government going to do to help out. And already, USTR has signed a joint statement to help in the implementation and further negotiation of the, the uh, free trade, trade agreement. So we are getting that. And they're, and they're really available to do things like uh, you know, non-trade barrier discussions, uh, regulatory impairments, uh, you know, things that we've heard around this table, movement of people and goods, those, those kind of things, all the way to how do you sign the World uh, Trade Organization uh, Trade Facilitation Agreement and get that done in a timely manner. So from that perspective, we stand very ready, and my colleagues around uh, this conference have talked about things from Prosper Africa to Power Africa and things like that. But so then secondly, we then think about how does our greatest asset participate, which is our private sector. And really, to one of your points earlier, is that if we do this, if this works, you will create the largest market in the globe. And I will promise you, when you create the largest market in the world, the U.S. 
private sector will be there to participate. I do think that when we think about it, and I've talked to both um, participants of the PAC DBIA, which is the President's Advisory Council on Doing Business in Africa, as well as the AMCHAM, to say to the private sector, what are you thinking about, what do you need? And they say, we need this market open because the cost of entry and operation is so high that we need to have scalability. But then they also talk about things that were talked about on this panel, such as what about the soft infrastructure, what about digitalization, um, the trade barrier issues, the movement of people and goods, as I said, and then the hard, um, and then the hard uh, infrastructure, such as power, rail, um, roads. And uh, I'll do my infomercial here that the U.S. companies stand very willing and ready to partner with all of you on those projects. And then finally, I want to speak a minute to the women's issue. Uh, I have to tell you, I thought uh, President Adeshami last night said it very well when he said a bird does not fly with one wing. It needs two wings to fly, and when the second wing is the wing of the women, you will fly higher and soar, soar better. But I will also tell you, from the U.S. perspective, uh, under this administration, we have created the, we call it uh, WGDP, uh, the Women's Global uh, Development and uh, Prosperity. And really what that does is it is an initiative by the administration. Uh, it is covered by Ivanka Trunk. She's been here to Africa twice. She's visited three of the four regions <coughs> to talk about this. And it talks about three pillars. Number one, women prospering in the workforce. How do you get them educated and trained? Number two, how do you create access to capital and things that we've talked about before? And then finally, what do you think about and how do you look at policies to eliminate barriers to entry, which you certainly have talked about before? So with that, those are my thoughts on those big topics. Thank you, Madam Secretary Lee. Let's uh, get you to join our online conversation using the official hashtag. It's hashtag Africa Investment Forum and hashtag AIF. 2019. Also, don't forget to tag us at AFDB underscore group and uh, at AIF Marketplace. I want to now bring you in, Minister Hakuzi Yeremye, and uh, if we can again go to the opportunities ahead, the biggest opportunities for investment when it comes to the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, thank you, Bronwyn. I think um, one example I can give is, is uh, as we, we try to really have this continental free trade area agreement not be some uh, theoretical uh, agreement that politicians or policymakers talk about, but that it resonates with, with not only our young entrepreneurs and our SMEs. Um, it's, it's really important, and we've started that dialogue with, with um, the private sector in Rwanda, where they also challenge us saying, when you go and, and, and uh, negotiate um, all these protocols under the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, why don't you include us? And already at the East African community, this is something we have started. The East African Business Council asked us to be part as an observer to the consultative meetings before we go and negotiate on a continental level because at the end of the day these are the private sector or the business people are the ones who are going to be uh, you know make this agreement a reality when we talk about non-tariff barriers it's not just what we see in reports but it's really talking to the people who are have to confront those barriers be it at the borders the time it takes for them to move goods from one country to the other and one example is um, you know, going to a country in an African country where they still have to apply for visas. And they give us an example that they would rather go to a Middle East country where they have a visa on arrival. And this is something that we have, uh, I think, to tackle as Africans. How do we really allow our people to move from country to country um, hassle-free and visa-free? Rwanda has applied that, and we see uh, that, that it's really something that has boosted the trade flows that we have. But it's important that we understand that for a business person, if they cannot go to the country where they would like to trade, they will not go to that country. Uh, and the second thing is, is also all the facilities we put in place uh, at regional level, um, 
national level to help our young startups. Uh, in Rwanda, with the, 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 the assistance of the African Development Bank, we started the Rwanda Innovation Fund. And really, we're grateful for the role that the African Development Bank is, is, uh, is, is playing, not only in um, securing infrastructure that we really need on the continent, but also, you know, starting those funds that will benefit the private sector in the end. Um, and, and it's a way for us also to attract the private sector in those uh, startups where we have the government putting in money, uh, our partners such as at the African Development Banks putting in money, and also all the partners. I think uh, for next year we're partnering with African, uh, uh, the Afrexim Bank to organize the second intra-Africa trade fair, which will address that information gap that uh, President Rama was talking about where um, private sector in Africa ha uh, need a platform to talk to each other, to know the goods that you know uh, our uh, brothers and sisters in West Africa, for instance, have that we can import um, as raw materials or process uh, goods into, into Rwanda instead of going outside of the continent. So these are the partnerships that we are seeing being created because of the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. And I'm confident that as we go, go forward, we will sit down here in, in two, three years and see really some partnership that have grown because of, of this agreement. Thank you. Ronnie, let's talk to the, the regional infrastructure investment and, and the opportunities that you see there. I'm assuming that many of them lie at the heart of Tello DB in railway. That, that's correct, Ronnie. So I'll, I'll try and be brief. I'm going to be naughty and take an opportunity to. So I've lived, I've lived a very big part of my life under pressure from President Adeshina, President Orama, President Adese to do more in rail, do more in rail, do more in rail. Today I'm going to take the opportunity to turn the table around and put them under pressure a little bit. <laughs> I'll explain why. Uh, President, you, you, you talked about the Nakala Corridor as an example. Let's, let's paint the picture much more broadly. Uh, if you look at the size of our continent, and if you look at the, the trade pattern, we're still primarily bulk commodities out uh, agricultural and mineral, and we're containers in, and we're fuel in, right? Uh, rail makes sense. So talking about casting our minds and imagining the Africa we dream of tomorrow, what trade arteries do we want to build on the continent? That's the role that we want to play. Take the, I want to use the Nakala Corridor as an example for a very specific reason. So a number of institutions funded uh, the Nakala Corridor We've got trains that operate on that corridor. We have a number of locomotives. Let's, let's break those locomotives apart. The traction motors came from GE in the US into South Africa. Uh, so you can imagine how much component input goes into a traction motor. A traction motor is the engine of a locomotive. If you see it, it's an intense piece of metal work. Uh, brought to South Africa, 40% uh, of the component value-wise is then contributed in an African country, we then export those locomotives and they operate in a market like Mozambique. Why do I talk about that? We are confident that we have the best global capacity to develop and operate railways on the continent. Ronnie, I'm going to ask you not to go off mic. So ah, no problem. Um, we are confident that we can develop and operate rail to global standard on the African continent. We are confident also that because of the demand for transportation, for, for mobility of goods and people, that we will become the biggest railway development market globally, just because of the gap between where we are today and the need. Now, if we as Tello DB, with the support of uh, 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 financial institutions, the DFIs on the continent, are developing the railway sector on the continent, we can influence where component, components come in. And I think we have to put a message forward that we will have an inclination to support global partners, component manufacturers that are present on the continent of Africa. That starts to create an industrial value chain based on Africa's demand, where we don't have to depend on anybody else in the world to take our produce. Literally. So the challenge that I want to put... Uh, I'm going to ask to you to get president. to that challenge quickly because you can't take I a will. conversation beyond the stage. I Remember, this is all the, about the, the, the transactions, challenge, transactions. The challenge that I want to put to our development finance institutions is 
let's already today, when we're doing railways, start talking to global component manufacturers in the railway industry to insource capability onto the continent of Africa. President Arama, let me bring you in. And uh, it was mentioned the Intra-Africa Trade Fair. Let's uh, get, uh, President Adashina, you want to respond to, no, I was just going to, to Ronnie's to, challenge there? Well, I was just going to put him back under pressure a little bit. Uh, <laughs> that that uh, we're very proud of TelodB, And I want to say that as we we're talking about the um, projects that the two presidents, President uh, of Tanzania and President of uh, Rwanda put forward. We're looking to them to help us, help us make that happen. So you asked, somebody asked me yesterday if I were to pick a company that, just like Mara, just like we did like Mara last year, what would that company be? And I say it would be TelodB. And so Ronnie, uh, next year at this forum, those transactions for all those rail linking things, you've got to deliver on them on this platform. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, Ronnie, Rolf says no pressure. No pressure from the Our head of technical either. is here. You're, you've got the mandate. <laughs> and remember, we're going to monitor. So we need to monitor and measure. We'll give you we all the support you need to, to, to make it. But if I might just add something while I we just add it, it's that the point that has been raised by the Emmy, um, which is, you know, when you talk about how we restructure um, our manufacturing areas. We talk quite a lot about free trade area. Well, if it's free trade and you see it's trading the same thing. So instead of sending it to China or to Europe, raw materials, you send it to yourselves, right? So I think we need to broaden that conversation to also how do we develop Africa as a manufacturing zone, right? So you are actually trading value added, high value products. Beneficiation. Yes among ourselves, but also developing the regional and global value chains that will allow us to do that. So when Ronnie is talking about rail, right, it's not just about moving bulk products. Why can't he develop his rail to go into the special agro-industrial zones, uh, processing zones that we are going to develop, where he can move uh, finished agricultural products out of Africa, areas that have minerals and metals that are actually having industries that are producing and adding value. So we just don't want any kind of infrastructure. We want smart infrastructure that allows us to take advantage of uh, regional and global value chains that, that we need to, uh, uh, to develop um, in this particular area. And, and last thing I just want to say where I have the mic is on this issue of cross-border investments. I want to salute all the Africans that are investing in other African countries. Um, because when you do that, it gives confidence, <clears throat> right? You invest in, in our neighborhood. You know, from 2003 to 2019, the size of that intra-Africa FDI is roughly $102 billion. South Africa, by the way, I'm, uh, MTN is a big part of that, accounts for about 40% of that, Nigeria, Morocco, Egypt, Kenya, these are the big ones. But we need to make sure that we make it easier for more African countries to trade among themselves so that FDI is not just concentrated among just these five countries. And aggregate GDP is somewhere between 2.1, 3.4 trillion dollars on a purchasing power parity perspective, 6.7 trillion dollars. That's the number we've got on the table. Uh, Professor, uh, President Arama, if you couldn't come in here and maybe bring in the Intra-Africa Trade Fair that a number of these people I know are supporting as well across the African continent as you roll out that forum. Yeah, thank you very much. As an honorable minister, uh, Rwanda has talked about it. Uh, just like this platform, uh, the Inter-African Trade Fair is a sister platform uh, that was uh, launched last year in Cairo uh, to bring African businesses so that they could meet each other, begin to deal with the trade information that is critical to promoting trade and investments across Africa. Last year, uh, we had uh, uh, more than 1,000 exhibitors. We had transactions that were concluded over $40 billion. We expect that in, in Kigali in September, we will far exceed these numbers. Already we are having early birds and we encourage everybody here uh, who is interested in doing business in Africa to go and register now. Uh, but on top of that, I want to just add before we close uh, that 
I can confirm uh, that uh, Africa has a gender problem. Uh, the women are pressing the men. The, the, <laughs> however, however, the, we at Afrexim Bank know that the women, the market women, all the uh, small traders who are doing all the trade, that they have a major problem of payments. They do not have a means of transferring money across borders. So they carry all the cash, they lose a lot of the money. So we have now developed a Pan-African payment and settlement system. Uh, and that payment and settlement system makes it possible for them to trade in their local currencies. We believe that this will boost the trade and this will make the women even bigger so that one day they will move from being market women to becoming SMEs and then large corporations. Thank you very much. President Tedesi. Just, just uh, two or three quick points. Uh, first of all, I think at the AIF, we, we, we give a lot of uh, attention to new deals, but I just wanted to highlight another value stream that does come out quite strongly that is not always visible to everybody. Facilitation and problem solving, because existing deals have to perform. And there's always a lot of challenges that need to be overcome. And, and, and I've just had three fascinating discussions today with three different clients. And all three clients were very inspired by the free trade agreement. But they needed facilitation of trade. They are not prepared to wait till July. They need to perform today. And so they were asking us if we can play a role to help them get some of the purchase orders that they need across borders through projects that we're financing in countries where they know there is need for supply. But then they were telling me, we know they're going to get this stuff from 10,000 kilometers away. We don't understand why we're not being considered for these opportunities. And we know they pro provide good content. So I think that's something that's uh, turned out to be quite interesting. And I think, I don't know how we report that in the AIF, Dr. Adashina, but I think there's a number of uh, business people who come here also looking for facilitation. And I've, I've been very happy to provide that. Rolf? Um, just, uh, I'll be very short. I mean, I think the areas of opportunities are certainly in power, road and rail, because without the infrastructure, you know, Africa's growth will be limited to 4% when it should really be more like 7, 8, towards 10%. So I think that underlying infrastructure is, is, is a massive opportunity, not because Ronnie is sitting next to me, but because it really will fund growth. And, and I'd just like to say that um, institutional investors, long-term money, that is not just invested in the equity capital markets, but has got a long time horizon, needs to be crowded in to this agreement because they can also facilitate and support. The other area that I see as an opportunity, and again is the point that's been made uh, by the president, is the digital um, economy. That can facilitate even faster growth on the back of a broad, sustained infrastructure. And we see it in the markets that we operate when we create marketplaces for the women and the youth that has been spoken to, is that they're able to trade and create a market on their phone. So all of a sudden, uh, a lady in Accra is able to provide goods and services more broadly uh, across Ghana. But what we are focusing on uh, in trying to connect particularly uh, mobile money across markets is that we, do we now need to build the infrastructure for mobile money across markets, which will also facilitate the growth. And then finally, I mean, I think the, the, the important part is that there is an, another political act that is required. That is to get the nations, uh, the citizens of nations to buy in. Because as the point was raised earlier on, there is going to be a cost uh, and we need to understand the transition cost and we need the countries and the political will to carry forward. Ade. Uh, time is up. Anyway. No, no, what, go ahead and what, make your point, sir. What no we've pressure. done in EcoBank, working with the rest of the other banks, we operate in 33 countries in Africa in terms of uh, uh, getting things done, and they are all connected. And therefore, it is possible today to make instant payment from any of the countries where we operate. And what we want to do is working with the rest of the financial institutions to ensure that anybody that wants to pay anybody in Africa, and from outside Africa, actually, is something the technology exists to make it possible. The next time we are talking on this stage, we should say it is done. Because without being able to make payment, it then becomes a difficult thing. The next thing I will say is that for people in the audience, especially from the developed world, 
If you go to Europe today, in Germany, you give government $100 million today, you get $98 million in 30 years' time. Definitely, Africa can generate better investment that won't exist out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our esteemed panelists. I'm going to ask you to give them another round of applause. But before we step off stage, I just want to put this back in the room. And that is that the free trade agreement connects at this stage 54 countries. We hope that Eritrea will come and make it the, the 55. And we will be looking at a scenario where we have 1.2 billion people today 1.7 billion people predicted by 2030. And those numbers again, $2.1 trillion in terms of aggregated GDP, somewhere between that $2.1 trillion number and the $3.4 trillion number. But remember, purchasing power parity. From that perspective, we're looking at $6.7 trillion. As Madam Secretary from the US was saying just a moment ago, and that if we get this right, ladies and gentlemen, and we create the biggest free trade area in the world by 2050, everyone will stand up and take note. Thank you very much. We're going to stand down from the stage. Thank you very much again to our panelists. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs>